Oh. <clears throat> so, we are going to do an interesting topic this morning. Because in every generation, in every culture, you, you have this struggle. Uh, labor and management, right? Labor and management. Now, they both have their own interests, but at the same time, labor and management, when they work together, they are most effective for everyone. And the best uh, that possibly can happen uh, does for everyone. But ultimately, people do things in their own best interest, don't they? It is a very rare situation where people are truly altruistic. Who knows what that word is, altruistic? Yeah, you would think it would have something to do with the name or the word itself. The word itself doesn't give you any clue to what it means. Altruistic. Anybody? It's the idea that a person would do good for good's sake. They would do good unselfishly for the greater good. Uh, altruistic motivations. Uh, you will find, if you are really honest with yourself, if you're a sinner, you're not saved, you're not born again yet, uh, and, and you don't know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're truly honest with yourself, even your altruism, or what you believe in your heart might be altruism, is tainted. Tainted with our sinful nature. Uh, there are very, very precious few people out there who would do good for good's sake without having a, a, another motivation. Uh, somebody who might do something very heroic, if they're sinful, if they're a sinner and they're not regenerated, you'll find if they really look inside themselves, they do something heroic because they want to be a hero. Not for the good of the person they're saving. They look at it as an opportunity to shine. And so even their good is tainted with the selfishness of, of self-aggrandizement. Uh, it's funny that way. A lot of the good that is done in this world uh, for medical purposes, perhaps elder care services, uh, people who leave good deals of money to do social good in this world, it's funny that they often feel the need to put their name on the building, don't they? Their altruism needs to bear their name. Well, we all do things that are in our own self-interest, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a wonderful thing when mature people can work together realizing that their common interests, uh, though they may be separated, that they can have common interests that work together. And labor and management, uh, when they work together well, can often... Uh, provide for the greater good. Now, now, of course, we saw some stuff this last week. How many of you saw the yellow trucking company uh, news? That was heartbreaking. The union was not negotiating in good faith with a company that was strapped. A company whose management didn't always do the best uh, by its company. They got themselves in some debt, and the union, of course, contributed to a lot of that, and and the union uh, pushed so hard that they pushed the yellow trucking company into bankruptcy. Who wins? I'll tell you who wins. The Teamsters didn't win. All those truck drivers who were unionized, they did not win because now you have a lot of people out of a job who still have bills to pay and mortgages uh, to pay. They didn't win. They put a company out of business. They killed the goose that laid the golden egg. Management did not win by some of the poor choices over the years that had straddled them with debt. And management made a lot of concessions and, and actually made some quite generous offers. Uh, but uh, the, the, the head of the Teamsters, they, they, they agreed, got the best of them, and they, they put them out of business. Now, there's something funny about that as well because... <clears throat> The Teamsters also work with other companies. Now, the Yellow Trunking Company and all their business will be bought off by other companies. But the workers are going to actually be in a, in a bad way. But how do we know whether the management of the union, the union leadership, wasn't in cahoots with one of these other large companies to put Yellow out of business so that they could come in and bargain basement prices, buy off chunks of that business without the debt. You have other big interests at play sometimes that doesn't always make 
the headlines of CNN, Fox News, or the Washington Post, or the New York Post, or any other post. But it gets pretty tough because, hey, there's going to be a whole bunch of guys who will be out of work for a while. <laughs> and it's going to be tough. Well, this thing about labor and management have been around for a long time. Uh, labor, they're the ones that get things done. Unfortunately, sometimes labor's got a condition where they don't get very much done, but labor is not a bad thing. We're coming up just in a couple weeks on Labor Day, aren't we? And uh, it's something to think about, but it just happens to coincide this morning with our morning message as we see what goes on there, as we kind of take on some of the challenges of uh, 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 this idea of, of, of labor and our responsibility and management and their responsibility and getting things done. Because getting things done is important. Getting nothing done, not always good. You, you can't sustain a society where labor gets paid to not actually labor. And management and government make money off the people by just asking for more money, more money, more money to not get things done. Eventually the system collapses as, as government will eventually borrow and borrow and borrow and then... <laughs> And then eventually problems happen, and, 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 and when that happens, you know, when you got a country that goes bankrupt, a city that goes bankrupt, it causes a lot of pain and suffering for everyone. It's good that everybody is as honest as they can be, and that they do uh, what they should. Let's go to Mark chapter number 6, and I just want to start off with an interesting treatise as we go into these thoughts. Mark chapter number 6. In my day job, I do belong to a union. I am a carpenter by trade. Uh, I did not fall into carpentry because my Lord and Savior was a carpenter and said, oh, as a Christian, that's what I want to do, and I'm going to be like Jesus, I'm going to be a carpenter. That, that is not how I ended up in, in, this, uh, in this trade. It, it just happened as it does. I work for the city of New York. As a carpenter, I'm probably the highest educated carpenter in New York. <laughs> 263, 267 civil servant carpenters. I probably have more education than just about all of them. <laughs> but uh, it keeps me here in New York and allows me to do the work of the church. Uh, helps me pay the bills and helps me to stay as your pastor, and I appreciate that. What we see in, in, in Mark chapter number 6, we see they are speaking about Jesus and they're astonished at him preaching in the synagogue in verse number 2. And he's eloquent. And he's saying some pretty tremendous things and, and he's using his intellect and he's dazzling these people and what does it say in verse number 3? They're surprised by Jesus' ability to move the crowd and speak to their need and to handle the arguments of the intellectual class. And why are they surprised? Verse number 3, somebody read it for me. And they were offended at him, right? They were offended at him because he's just a carpenter. He's just a worker. This is around his own hometown. And notice that it, they, these people kind of knew his backstory. So it wasn't like when he was in Jerusalem and the uh, Pharisees would use this, this slander, Jesus, the uh, son of Mary. Uh, you know, suggesting that he was a bastard because they all knew that Joseph wasn't his father. But they, they, these are people from his hometown who knew Joseph was a carpenter. And here Jesus was. Jesus had followed in his father's footsteps and was also in the carpenter trade. And here he was, about 30. In, in the olden days, in these days, from the time you were a teenager, in the earliest parts of your teens, you began to learn a trade. Generally speaking, by the time you were 10, 11, 12 years old, you were often working full time in some kind of labor or some kind of a trade or a discipline. You'll remember that during the <clears throat> Middle Ages, 
the earlier or, or the forerunners of trade unions uh, existed across Europe in something that was called guilds. And the guild represented in any town or community uh, a, ver a various discipline of skilled trade or skilled labor. Uh, maybe they were carpenters, maybe they were plumbers, maybe they were brick masons, maybe they were metal workers of some kind. A and their guild, they got together to protect the interests of each other. They, on some level, would help to set a price for, so there was a little bit of price fixing in a various community, but try to set a price in the interest of the various members of their trade. Uh, they set the standards by which a person could get into a trade. Uh, you, you had to get, of course, their certification. And in order to do that, you, you had to train for a certain number of years under a master in that trade. And training under a master for several years, you would have to, at the end of that trade, perform a work that was of the quality of mastery that showed that you had indeed mastered the techniques involved in that trade, and you would have to present it to a crowd of other tradesmen who would evaluate your work and decide whether you were indeed worthy to continue the craftsmanship. It, it has its pluses and minuses, but it established a certain level of quality that would be accepted within a trade uh, for public consumption. And so there was always these nuances within <clears throat> the trade and the market which had these various philosophical things that we could argue about today, but uh, that, that had nuances that showed either the interest of the worker or showed the interest of the public good and, and what level a free market uh, eventually had in a, a thriving or growing economy. It presents a lot of interesting challenges, and, and I recommend that Christians, you well-verse yourself in the various points of view of the various interest groups of, uh, of labor, management, and quite frankly, society as a whole, the customer, and a free market. On what level should a market be free, and on what level should there be regulation? These are all deep questions, but these are things we should all educate ourselves about. Amen? We're, we're going to live God's grace. We're going to live, on average, 70, 74 years. During that period of time, you go to school for how many of those years? From the time you're about five or six years old till you're about 17, 18? Then maybe you go to college for four, six, or eight years? Well, that's a, a chunk of your life, but... Hey, does that mean you've got to stop learning that you can't keep growing as a person and your intellectual pursuits and your understanding of the world? No, you can continue to grow. Our Savior was a carpenter by trade. Even in the first century, throughout Rome, they had various guilds or union-like structures within any community that helped to set prices for labor and helped to set uh, prices for goods and services. Uh, that were in the interest of <clears throat> the worker. But that balance in the society is, hey, you, you, can, you can set a high price for your work, but if nobody can afford to buy it, <laughs> you're going to be out of work, aren't you? Uh, but there are various markets. There, there are some high-end markets where, hey, you have rich people, and there's nothing wrong with rich people. You know why? Rich people like things, and they buy things. Rich people have very nice houses. Those houses did not get built by rich people. Those houses got built by labor. And they're usually not just regular houses. When you get into some rich person's house, a lot of times they like stuff like crown molding. That's the molding that goes up around the ceiling. Not just a, a cheap piece of wood around the bottom for base molding, but they like crown molding. Sometimes, like we have here, we've got the paneling on the wall with the, the chair rail molding around the, in the bottom. But believe it or not, this is this was it, it's pretty worn, and our building got beat up over the last 30 years or so, 20 years especially. Uh, well, 20 years especially because of the work over there. But But a lot of this molding is really quite skilled work. 
In fact, it's quite impressive. It's, it's several layers of wood on top of each other to give the effect or the perspective that it's one contiguous piece. And many of these joints were very tight, and some of those joints actually went around rounded edges. And the way that they were pieced together were, were quite masterful. And now the destruction on our building because of the excavation next door has pulled many of these joints apart so that you can see where they are joined. But, you know, they were seamless because of the high quality craftsmanship that had been done when the people of this church built this church and put their labor into it. There was genuine craftsmanship by people who had done it for years had developed an eye for perfection. And craftsmen who are true craftsmen often are not satisfied with anything less than an A in the quality of their work and often demand out of themselves A plus work every time as a source of pride and respect or self-respect. They want to give their very best. And anything less than that, of course, especially on a quality project, is, is just not satisfying. You can't go home and live with yourself. Now, I work for the public uh, system, and, and i got to tell you the kind of craftsmanship we see there, it's less than stellar. Uh, a lot of the people are being hired, and they don't, very, they don't know very much. In fact, they're not craftsmen at all. But learning a craft often takes years of discipline of the mind. It takes oversight. It takes direction. You learn the right way to do things, the wrong way to do things, and then your way to do things. <laughs> and it is good when you're growing in a craft to, to look at different people and, and how they do things and, and grow from that. But these crafts, they're, they're very important to, to be able to have a quality workmanship. So having rich people is not a problem in society because rich people buy things that are intricate and allow craftsmen, quite honestly, to perform their craft at the highest possible levels. And then you have middle class people and they get their craftsmanship and their work done generally on a, on a more utilitarian level. But I was a contractor for a decade and a half and you know what I learned as a contractor? <clears throat> Poor people cannot afford to pay you enough to live. They want and need things done at their house. But they would call me up and say, Pastor Mead, because they knew I was a pastor. Pastor Mead, we need our house painted. Can you paint our house? And I'd tell them what a price was. And I'm usually giving them a very good price. They say, oh, I thought it would be much less than that. I thought we could just pay you $200. I said, I can't even buy the paint for this room for $200. I would be spending money out of my own pocket to do your job. Oh, uh, people want things all the time, but they don't always understand it. In fact, I've never gotten a job from a poor person to where I could actually support my family. The poor you have with you always, but they, they, they don't support the middle class. Uh, the middle class is supported by some of the other middle class and by rich people. <laughs> it is what it is. There's nothing wrong with people who have been very successful in life. The yachts, the fancy cars, the various conversions, van conversions, and the sprinter conversions, the, the, the high security conversions, uh, the various things that are necessary for high security in, in large apartment buildings or in large... Uh, commercial buildings, rich people pay for those things. If you have a job in IT, guess, guess who's paying your bills? The bulk of that is being driven by rich people who need a higher level of security because criminals are getting cl more clever. <laughs> so other people who have things to lose want to protect it, and they pay a company who employs you to protect them. So nothing wrong, and we need to get away from this idea in society that there should be no rich and there should be no poor. Uh, we've been 2,000 years since our Savior, Jesus Christ, walked this earth. And he said, the poor you have with you always. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to do what's best for society and, 
and, and develop a society where there are fewer poor people. But you will always have people, and I've noticed this over the last 25, 30 years of ministry, you will have always have people who no matter how much money you give them, they are always poor at the end of the day. And I've ministered to a lot of them. If they have $5 in their pocket, they'll spend $5 and they'll be poor. If they have $500 in their pocket, they will spend $500. When we were very poor ourselves, I was very careful at managing our money, wasn't I? Even while we did trades work and I tried to build a business, and, and we would have people who were on public welfare, they had free health insurance paid for by the taxpayers, they had food stamps paid for by the taxpayers, on their EBD card they would get 50 to $200 extra every month as a bonus for, for whatever excuse the government found to give them money and they could buy diapers with it or whatever funded by the taxpayer they had reduced to free rent wherever they were living the government was paying the rent which is never the government it's the taxpayers the workers who are paying taxes they're the ones giving the money to the government government doesn't have anything it doesn't take from you first and so these people would have government supplied rent. The, the rent was paid for by the, the taxpaying or the productive citizen. They kept no job unless they were scheming and scamming on the side. They have three, four kids, all stuffed into the house at birthday parties. Their kids had the little toys that were battery powered and the kids could sit in it and run around with a battery powered little car. You get two, three, four hundred dollars worth of toys on a birthday party, uh, expensive cake. They didn't ever bother to cook and make a cake. They would go to the store and they'd buy a seventy dollar cake. Their check would come in on the first. They would have their party on the second. And within two weeks of being paid, Pastor Mead, Pastor Mead. Oh, we're out of money. I don't have any money for milk or bread. Uh, the children need diapers. Can you give us something at the church? Can you give us anything? And I've sat down with them and said, let's go through the budget. Because on paper, you make more money than I do. And I also have kids in diapers. How come we have enough money and you don't? Well... When you spend four or six hundred dollars on birthday parties in the first week you get your check, and then on the second week you have no money, that's why you kids don't have diapers and bread and milk. When you take your EBD card where they give you four or six hundred dollars of grocery money on there, and you go to a scammer sea town, and the Muslim guy over there will take your card, ring up a false <laughs> grocery list, and then turn around and give you, for your $600, they'll give you $300 in cash, and you walk out of there with cash and no groceries, and he pretends that he rang up groceries and took all your money. That's why you have no money. And then they call me up and say, Pastor Mead, we need money. Can you give us money? The church has no money. What you're doing is you're asking me if I will share the money I'm going to buy my children their diapers with. My children have no new clothes. We wear 100% hand-me-downs. My children have diapers, but they have no electric car to run around a tiny apartment with and never got any cool toys. But your kids get all these cool toys. Listen, the poor you have with you always because it's a mindset. In the land of opportunity where there is tremendous opportunity, somebody will always find an excuse why they should have what you have. America, especially in this modern days, we are incredibly generous. Incredibly generous. But I've tried over the years to say, hey, maybe I can teach you something. I can teach you a trade. I can tell you what I know so that you can go out and make some money. I can show you how to paint. I can show you how to do brickwork. I can show you how to make a door. I can show you how to do something and you can make money for yourself and you don't have to depend on the government giving you free stuff. You can be wealthier. You can move out of poverty into the middle class if you really want to. But you have to change the way you think about money and how you spend it. Well, a healthy society has a very large middle class and a large middle class is based in the workers and that's a good thing well let's go to Isaiah 41 because we're going to look at some verses this morning don't want to eat up all my time talking 
Isaiah 41, verse 7. <clears throat> we see a little bit of the camaraderie among the skilled trades, among people who work for a living, that, that there's some respect one for another. In verse number 6, it ends, it says to his brother, Be of good courage, so the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith. And he that smootheth with the hammer him that smote the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. And he fastened it with nails, that it should not be moved. Amen. He uses this as a little bit of an illustration to show workers working together, encouraging one another. In chapter 44, verse number 13. There are a lot of, by the way, a lot of illustrations in the prophets as well as in the Gospels and occasionally in Paul's epistles. A lot of illustrations that are drawn directly from the experience of skilled trades. And you've got to know a little bit of something to appreciate what's actually being prophesied. Chapter 44, verse number 13, The carpenter stretcheth out his rule, he marketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with planes, and he marketh it out with the compass, and maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. Now, this is uh, speaking, of course, about him uh, in his work in, in fashioning wood. We talk about the very steps and processes of, uh, of the skilled trade, and it's interesting because Isaiah, the prophet, uh, is believed to have been of noble birth. There, there's evidence in the scripture that he belonged to the royal family. That he himself would have had a very good education, and certainly from the length of his prophecy, the, the depth of his prophecy, the, 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 the rounded perspective of his understanding of the world, it, it suggests that Isaiah is a very well-educated man. In his education, it's apparent that the, the many, and he, he uses many, many uh, skilled trades illustrations, is that he's got, at the very least, a hobby. <laughs> and perhaps, as a prophet of God, he, he may very well have worked as a skilled tradesman, even though he had been a member of the house, uh, the noble house and the ruling family. That he may have had an outlet among the skilled trades, or an interest in work. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. You'll find that many, many men who are geniuses throughout history, intellectually geniuses, often had a foundation in skilled trades. They worked for a living. They worked with their hands. I, I have found over the years many college professors often have a hobby on the side where they work with their hands. Because you know when you're a, a teacher or a college professor or, or, or like I am as a pastor, you have difficulty quantifying the quality of your work when you're delivering information. Every once in a while, God throws you a bone and some of your students become successful and well-rounded people. And uh, you can take a little bit of heart in knowing that you, you had a part in that. You played a little part along the way. Uh, but it's tough. When you, when you have a lot of intellectual pursuits, it's tough to quantify the quality or the meaning of your work when, when you're doing it. When you're in a pastorship, you see so many people get saved. You see some people fall away and fall away from the faith. You put so much effort into them. You put so much heart into them. And, and you put so much training and discipline and taught them so many things to, to just watch it fade away, you know, to watch it uh, disappear. And you go, how do you quantify that? Some churches quantify it with large amounts of numbers. Hey, if you got lots of people in church, uh, that's how a pastor can feel good. I'm doing a great job, right? Pastor's doing a great job. They have 200 people in church. They have 300 people in church. Does that mean a pastor's doing a great job? Now, you, you guys are mature enough to know that doesn't mean anything. If you go in the south, uh, southern part of this country, you, you, you can't throw a rock in a crowd without hitting a Baptist. <laughs> And every couple of years, you might have three, four, five hundred people or a thousand people, but two thirds of those people belong to some other church. And there's just a pattern of people rotating from church to church to church in those areas. The numbers don't really mean much of anything. You don't have to work very hard. There's not much struggle. You don't go door knocking. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything. People just come to church because that's what they do. They go to church. 
And that's wonderful, but, but you can't pat yourself on the back and think, wow, what a great work we built for God. It was easy. All you had to do was show up, preach a 20-minute message, and go home. As long as you didn't offend anybody, people were just going to keep coming. It was easy. You want to impress me? Leave your 2,000-member church down in South Carolina and come here and show us all how it's done. If you run 200 up here, then I'll really be impressed. <laughs> I've been doing this for a couple decades in New York, and none of us are running numbers like that in, in the most populous city in the, in, the, well, in the whole country. The most densely populated borough. And uh, even the charismatics and the people who are loose and they don't say anything to offend anybody and they bend over backwards and compromise all the biblical principles, they're not running very good numbers. Because reprobate is reprobate. Reprobates don't want to go to church. People who hate God don't go to church just because you soften the message. And you won't say anything that offends them. So that, those, those things aren't impressive. And of course they don't impress God either. But it is kind of hard to quantify the quality of your work. And so for a long time, I really appreciated being in the skilled trade because at the end of the day, when I did projects, uh, when I was a carpenter or a contractor, I finished the kitchen. I could say it looked ugly and it was like this. It was horrible. And at the end, I could look at it and say, yeah, I did something. Now, all human projects are temporary, aren't they? They all fall apart and eventually need maintenance. Well, if it needs maintenance, it needs maintenance. Let's go in the Bible to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter number 12. Second Kings chapter number 12, verse number 8. It says, The priest consented to receive no more money of the people, neither to repair the breaches of the house. But Jehoiada, the priest, took a chest and bored a hole in the lid of it and set it beside the altar on the right side as one cometh into the house of the Lord. And the priest that kept the door put therein all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. Okay, so money was coming in, tithes were coming in. Bible says it was coming, the priests had brought it in, but the, it says it was coming from the people. And it was so, when they saw that there was much money in the chest, that the king's scribes and the high priests came up, and they put up in bags and told the money that was found in the house of the Lord. And they gave the money being told into the, how, into the hands of them that did the work, that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they laid it out to the carpenters and the builders and wrought upon the house of the Lord and to masons and to the hewers of stone and to buy timber and hewed stone to repair the breaches of the house of the Lord. And for all that was laid out of the house to repair it. Howbeit there was not made for the house of the Lord bowls and silvers and snuffers and basins trumpets and these are all the, the various tools that, 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 that are in there. It says, but they gave that to the workmen and repaired therewith the house of the Lord. Moreover they reckoned not with the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be bestowed on the workmen for they dealt faithfully. What does that mean? It, it basically is this. They didn't have to fight with the workmen over actually doing the work. Because sometimes you have the skilled trades, they want to be paid for doing nothing. It says, no, but the skilled trades, the workers that were working on the house of the Lord, the Bible says they were faithful and they didn't have to haggle about the money. Because the labor was delivered, the labor was executed, and the money was executed. Things worked nicely. And you know what happened? God's house got repaired. God's house got repaired. Now... I want you to go to chapter number 22. Chapter 22 of the same book, 2 Kings chapter 22. I want you to notice this. We are 10 chapters ahead. We are many kings ahead. A lot of time has passed under the bridge between chapter 12 and chapter 22. 
Look at verses number 3 through 7. Josiah is the king. It says in verse number 3, And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah, so he started reigning when he was eight, 18th year, he's in his mid-20s, that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people, these are the offerings taken, taken from the congregants. And let them deliver it into the hands of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to repair the breaches of the house. Unto carpenters and builders and masons and to buy timber and hewed stone and repair the house. Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into the hand, because they dealt faithfully. Oh, it's so nice when you got faithful workers and faithful uh, ministers. Here a good deal of time had happened, and wear and tear had occurred on the house of the Lord, and the building had to be fixed again. The building had to be fixed again. And it costs money. Was it easy? Was it cheap? No. Uh, but it costs money. And sometimes you have to part with money to make the house of the Lord look better. And you hate it. Especially when you spend so much time trying to save it. But sometimes it's got to be parted to make the repairs necessary. Now it's important to know. Uh, God knows what it costs to pay labor to do work. God knows what the regulations are. God knows where we live. Amen. This is an incredibly expensive city to get anything done. God knows. And this is his house, isn't it? This is a house dedicated to him. Our church is a place of worship dedicated to him. It needs fixed. Our God shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And he will help us to fix his house and to repair the breaches. It will need to be done again someday. Because in this life, everything is temporary. Well, even our wealth is temporary. But nothing you do for God is ever in vain, is it? No. Josiah fixed the house of the Lord. Not too long after Josiah, within another hundred years, God would destroy the place. In fact, the temple itself would be completely demolished, you know? Uh, the Nebuchadnezzar and the guys you think God didn't know that a, a war was coming in the future that would destroy this house they just repaired of course he did does it mean God didn't want the house repaired then for those people yes he did hey when the war came in Nebuchadnezzar it made all of their money worthless didn't it yes it did but it doesn't mean God didn't want it done go with me to Jeremiah chapter number 24 we're moving fast now because I ate up all my time setting the stage. Jeremiah 24. Here's what's fascinating. Nebuchadnezzar comes in and destroys this place. When he takes... This is what's fascinating. Nebuchadnezzar, very clever, very smart, sent by God to punish God's people for their disobedience when they got away. Josiah, there was revival. The church got fixed. Things got better. Jeremiah 24. I want you to read verse number one. Somebody read for me verse number one. Okay. The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After that, the king of Babylon had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of the king of Judah. Stop there. That makes sense, doesn't it? Nebuchadnezzar carries away the king and the priests, or, or the princes. He takes all the leadership out of Jerusalem. But it, it's not a period there, it's a comma. Brother, go ahead and finish that. The princes of Judah, with the carpenters and smiths of Jerusalem, and had built up to Babylon. Oh, now that's an interesting thought. So Nebuchadnezzar snatches away the kings and the princes, all the nobility class, the ruling class. He takes them away, takes them to Babylon. But what else does he take that the Bible carefully inserts into this verse? Carpenters and smiths. The skilled tradesmen. 
He takes the skilled tradesmen out of Jerusalem and leaves the city without people who know how to fix and build things. See, that's smart. That shows you how clever and how important skilled tradesmen is. People who work for a living, people who know how to fix and build things. That is incredibly important. Because without them, you can't get things done. Knowledge is lost. And it's not easily gained again. Nebuchadnezzar was putting a very interesting note in there. Uh, the Bible puts a very interesting note in there. And that Nebuchadnezzar considered the value of the skilled tradesmen as high as taking away the princes and the, the noble class itself. Pretty cool, huh? Well, <clears throat> I want you to go quickly to, to, to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, chapter number 5, verse number 11. King David was trying to have a massive works project, a public works project, an important one that needed to be done, is building his palace, and then he would be building the house of the Lord. Uh, but I want you to notice something here. In verse number 11, the Bible says, And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David. So David's king of uh, Israel, is king of Judah, king of uh, out of Jerusalem but the king of Tyre or Sire, Tyre and Sidon which is southern Lebanon uh, that's where the uh, cedar trees grow right on the Lebanese flag even today they got a cedar tree right the cedars of Lebanon very famous right. sent messengers to David and what did he send with the messengers cedar trees and carpenters and masons and they built David a house uh, what does that strongly suggest is that in Israel, they did not have an appropriate number of skilled trades. They didn't have skilled tradesmen to actually do the public works project. They imported workers from a friendly nation who had skilled tradesmen. So Tyre and Sidon and southern Lebanon, they had skilled tradesmen. And David needed them, and there was a negotiation, and as a result, the king of one nation sent people over into Israel to help do the work as, as public tradesmen. And with these skilled trades, they, they built the house of David and the house of God. Yes, Mom? So, at this time, were there a lot of wars and a lot of men killed? There was a lot of wars and there were a lot of men killed. This is true. David had uh, just spent decades in war, and, and a lot of men had been uh, taken out there. Uh, Tyre and Sidon, they, they were, uh, during that period of time, a much, much more stable nation and had not had the level of war that these men had had. And so that knowledge had not been lost. And as a result, David was willing to import and borrow brains. And I just want to say that in light of our, our current immigration thing. Everything should be done decently and in order. It really should. This was a negotiation between two governments to supply the labor that one government needed from another. But it was with permission and part of the official immigration program and a need for that labor to be brought in. And that's, that's an important thing. Everything should be done decently and in order. And uh, unfortunately today, things are not. We're in a position where we have a lot of public works projects and we have some pretty incredible ambitions, um, ambitious ideas with our green technology plans, our infrastructure plans. We've spent enormous money on infrastructure and haven't built almost anything. We spent trillions of dollars in the last couple of years, couple of years, just flooding the economy. Where's the money going? Nobody knows. But infrastructure is not actually being built in equal measure. And part of the problem is we, we don't have plumbers. We don't have carpenters. We don't have electricians. You have to have people to work in factories that smelt iron, that, that extract copper and ore. You, you know, electrification requires copper. 
enormous amounts of copper. This city alone is sitting on an entire network of electrical grid, which is already aged out and needs to be almost completely replaced. And we're talking about a million miles of copper wire that need replaced in this city alone. And then the upgrade for electric cars and electrification, it, it, it's an undaunting task, but we don't even have the copper in the ground. And they're trying to make these very ambitious things. It is being executed so poorly. So, so halfway willy-nilly, throw something against the wall, hope it sticks kind of way. It is so amateur. And it's embarrassing uh, what's, what's going on today in our modern culture. But we have very ambitious plans. But we don't have skilled tradesmen to do the job. So skilled tradesmen are being paid more and more and more and more. Uh, plumbers in this city make two to 300000 a year. Now, people look down on the plumbing profession, right? Oh, plumbers, they do... They work with, with sewer and disgusting things. A lot of people, if they really sat and thought about it, says, hey, for two, three hundred thousand a year, I could work with sewer. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, it's a thing that mo many young people don't want to get into the skilled trades today. They, they all want to be uh, in a soft, cushy office job. We have a deep need for nurses. We need construction workers who can actually build and carpenters that can actually build uh, houses. We have a major shortage of houses. And we have a government that is so unbelievably short-sighted uh, and disjointed that, that we're, we're in, a, in a genuine pickle as far as a culture and a society and economy. I, I don't know. There's, there's just no easy way out of that. But we're in a similar situation where we need skilled workers and uh, government doesn't have a plan to get it. <laughs> Ezra 3.7, we get our workers, amen. And Ezra, they're rebuilding the temple after Babylon. In verse number 6, From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. They gave money also unto the masons, unto the carpenters, and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon, and to them of Tyre, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea of Joppa, according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. They had government money to create a government project. But man, it kept the workers going. And I remember when I was praying uh, eight years ago, nine years ago now, over whether I should take a city job because it's so corrupt. <laughs> and I remember praying deeply about it and we're at the end of a phase in our life and Mama Sita and I had gone up to Lake George and my credit cards have been maxed out with, with work for, for other people. And we we're in a lot of trouble financially. And I uh, wasn't making any money. Because the problem is when you're a contractor and people know you're a pastor, you can't overcharge them because you don't want them to think you're cheating them. And in a fiat economy where inflation is rampant, it's <laughs> and so I was always undercharging people. And, uh, and it put us in a pickle. And uh, I remember praying, and, and I was praying. I says, well, God, if you want me to continue, if you want this church to continue, want me to keep preaching, I says, you got to pay for this stuff. I said, I can't. I can't afford this. I can't afford to go. I was just so broken and so tired. And Mama Sita, I don't know if the kids remember, but Mom can probably remember me getting on my knees next to the bed at a hotel room for a two-day vacation because there was a year there. I literally had three days off in the entire year. Three days off, not three days like vacation. I mean, no Saturday, no Sunday, working every single day for the church or for work. Three days in the entire year. Skin is bleached white. My eyes are tired. My eyes are black underneath there, red all the time. Got down on my knees and I prayed. And I said, God, if you want this church to keep going, I says, you got to pay for it. I can't afford this. You have to make a way. It was a very simple prayer, probably done in about a minute. Said in Jesus' name, Amen. You remember? Less than ten minutes later, what happened? I got a phone call. Got a phone call. And what happened on that phone call? I got offered a job. I got offered a job. I got offered a job where? Brooklyn uh, College. Brooklyn College to work as a 
carpenter. And I, this guy, I had pastored his wife and helped her with her immigration, baptized her. And he called me up and says, hey, are, are, are you interested in this? I was thinking about you because we have this grant money. We got a million dollars from the federal government to make improvements and green, green up some things. And we're just, we need a carpenter for the next three months turned into six months because they had so much money. I says, well, let me pray about this. Because I says, I don't want this to be a trick of the devil <laughs> messing with my mind. And I opened up the Bible. I said, God, give me something. And I opened up the Bible right there in Israel, and they hired carpenters. The Public Works Project, and they hired carpenters. The Holy Spirit said, I want this church to keep going. I want you to keep preaching for these, my people. In the next five months, I paid 100% of my credit cards off. Got out of debt. My boss liked me so well. He says, hey, they're giving a test that the carpenters had a test with the city of New York. He says, I can't hire or fire, he said, but if I could, I'd hire you. He says, but you should take this test. I took the test. I was number 16. Out of 5,000 people that took the test, I was number 16 on the list. I shared a grade with eight other people. I got picked up in the first round, the first call, and I've been able to keep going with this church and pay our bills. Amen. And oddly enough, when I prayed about it the second time for the city job, that was a permanent job, I opened the Bible. I mean, when I mean open the Bible, I mean I did this. <laughs> it was the exact same verse. And they hired carpenters. It was God's will. Father, thank you for the word this morning. I pray that you give us grace as we deliver on these uh, challenging topics. And Heavenly Father, that your people would be a people of balance and understanding. That we would respect labor, we would respect management, we would respect the free market, we would respect also the interests of those who, who, who need to make a certain wage, that none of us should be slaves. That we might live as free men, comfortable before thy sight, Father to supply for our families, Lord, to live honorable lives peaceably, Lord. And the Heavenly Father, you might be pleased with us in our short little time that we have here on earth and that we might be the peacemakers, that we might be the peacemakers in a world gone crazy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.